morning, everyone. Would you please stand with us?
says in Psalm chapter 47, verse 1, it says, Clap your hands, all you people, and sing a loud song of joy. So this morning, why don't we clap our hands together? This is one of the ways we get to participate in making a, a, a loud noise, a joyful song to our Lord. Let's sing together, come and stand. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence strong. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above, is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. to welcome one another, greet one another as you take a seat. And uh, hey, we've got some seats up front if you want to come up front or scoot in towards one another to make plenty of room. But just take a moment and greet one another. Hi guys hey good morning I love that last song rejoice you know I was speaking to somebody this week and she said that rejoice also means be being be, being grateful you know being grateful is so awesome to be to have a God and to have a God that loves us so welcome everybody it's so awesome to be here today um, I'd like to give a special welcome to the newcomers thank you for choosing to be here with us today and we'd like to give you a small gift 
So if you could, after the service, walk and towards the right, you will see the Welcome Center. We have a small gift, and someone will be there to speak to you guys about any questions or concerns. Um, we'd like to just get to know you. Um, so we actually, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of good stuff going on in the church, including the Life Group. And Life Group is actually right now. So if you guys haven't signed up for that, um, sign up online. And we have a video of the announcements to watch, so watch that with me. We're excited to announce that Calvary will be hosting the annual fundraising dinner for the Compassion Pregnancy Center. We believe that God is for life. And at the Compassion Pregnancy Center, they are on the front lines defending the lives of the unborn. If this is a ministry that is important to you, please consider buying a ticket to their annual fundraising dinner here at Calvary. One way our church seeks to nurture believers is through our training forums. These are evenings where we gather together to talk about different topics and ways that we can engage with them faithfully as Christians. Our next training forum is all about faith and technology. We hope you'll be able to join us for that next training forum. Childcare will be provided. Hey church, Pastor Andrew here. Hey, we all know that money and finances are huge in our lives and that financial difficulty touches just about every single area of our lives. And so that's why we're bringing financial peace to Calvary Monterey. And so take a quick look at this clip for a bit of a preview. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I am not going to live like this anymore. I can personally testify to the effect that this class has. My wife Danielle and I went through it and we paid off $45,000 in debt and we were able to save enough to adopt our two oldest kids internationally from Ethiopia. And I can tell you that had we not gone through this class, those things would not have happened. So get online, go to calvary.com events, sign up at the link there, Pay the money to join the class. I would venture to say that the money you commit to joining the class will pay you back over just the first couple of weeks, few weeks of the class, but definitely over the first few months and year. Um, may even be the best investment you ever make uh, long term. And if you commit, if you really, really commit to the class and that's not the case, I promise I will personally pay you back for the class out of my own pocket. So come on, join me on this journey to financial peace, and I look forward to seeing you there. If you'd like any more information about what you've just heard, visit us online at calvary.com. Thanks for joining us today. Financial peace is pretty awesome. I took, we took that class, um, Andrew's class, and that's the way I got out of my student loan. So a lot of, some of you guys know that student loans can be pretty bad. But, uh, so let's, let's continue to worship. Um, but at this time, we're going to prepare to receive the tithes and offerings so the ushers can come on up as I pray for the offering. Father, thank you for being an awesome God. Thank you for being a merciful God. And thank you, Jesus, for saving many lives, including mine. So at this time, I, I pray that we would be able to give you our offerings our offering with a grateful heart, with a cheerful heart, for the simple fact that you died for our sins. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue your work in here today. As we continue to worship you with songs and the study of, of the word, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The king of my heart 
be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. kindness towards us is without end. Lord, you are long-suffering. You are patient with us, God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you did not withhold yourself from us, but you gave your only Son as a sacrifice in our place. You've called us your children, adopted us into your family. so many ways for so many reasons you are good Lord you are good to us thank you God how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not desperation I 
turn to air and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow
your name, it's your power, it's your might, it's your cross, it's your gospel, it's your victory, it's your blood that pushes back upon the spirit, the God of this age, the principalities and powers of darkness that have so deceived the nations and brought about a spiritual blindness on the hearts and souls of men whom you love. And so, Lord, our prayer is that your name, your power, your truth would wave through this community, Lord. And that progressively, God, eyes would be opened to see the light of who you are. And so, Lord, we pray for that. We ask that you would do it. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives, and we pray and ask this morning humbly for the strength of your Holy Spirit, for everything that you've put, Lord, in our lives. Would you help us, Lord, to walk with you? Would you give us the wisdom, Lord, that we need? Would you transform our character, our nature, Lord, to be more conformed to the image of Christ? Would you give us, Lord, gifts and opportunities and enablings, Lord, that are just outside of us, Lord, beyond us? Would you give us, Lord, the words to speak at the right moments? And would you, Lord, stir within our hearts and help us as we serve you in our jobs, careers, our families, our workplaces, our day-to-day, Lord, would you please fill and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit? And Lord, today we gather in your name because of who you are, and we ask, Lord, that you'd meet us in this place. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. 
If we could uh, turn in our Bibles today to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter uh, 18. We're going through the life of David right now as a church, and today we come to 2 Samuel, chapter 18. We'll go all the way through uh, 2 Samuel, so a few more chapters to go. And uh, if you need a Bible, just shoot your hand in the air. We'll get one to you. But just a reminder for you of kind of where we're at in the life of David at this point. He's been king now for a pretty long stretch of time. He's in his mid to late 50s at this point, and his son Absalom uh, has betrayed him and has stolen the hearts of the men and women of Israel. Absalom was a very attractive man externally. He had long hair. The narrator tells us that every time he cut it off, they would weigh it, so he was a very vain kind of guy. So it's like he was handsome. He knew he was handsome, And he manipulated the hearts of the people of Israel. So he's stolen their hearts at the point that we're entering into this morning. And David, because of that, has had to flee from Jerusalem. He's out in the wilderness in a city called Mahanaim, and that's where he is. And their two forces are kind of building. Absalom, his son, and David and his armies, their forces are building. And this is going to come together in one massive battle uh, against each other in that text we're going to read today, Absalom is going to die. So I, 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 probably many of you knew that already. I'm not trying to give a spoiler or anything, but Absalom's going to die, and we're going to learn about that a little bit uh, this morning. So that's where we're going, and that's kind of the, the setting uh, that we're in today. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us in his word today. Lord, we, we thank you for your word, every bit of it, every portion of it. We thank you for the way in which it speaks of you, and we pray that you would teach us Lord, not just about ourselves or about David or Absalom this morning, but that you'd teach us about yourself, your, your heart, as we look into your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, as we look at Absalom today and his death, I want you to remember a very special moment in David's life from 2 Samuel chapter 7. You might remember there was a time when David had first become the king in Israel and had first taken Jerusalem to be the new capital for Israel, that David moved the ark into Jerusalem and in his exuberance and love for God, declared to Nathan the prophet that he wanted to build God a permanent house, a permanent structure. You remember that? Now, up to that point, God had a home, a house. It was a tabernacle, though. It was, it was a tent that God had given the directions or the design to, to Moses, but D- David wanted to turn that into a permanent structure. For him, it was a way of saying, we as the people of Israel, God's people, we now have permanence, and this city of Jerusalem is his permanent you know, capital or epicenter, so we can build a permanent house for God here in Jerusalem, and God liked the idea, but David would not be the one to build the house. It would be his son Solomon who built the permanent structure, the permanent temple. But David took that desire to Nathan the prophet. He said, this is what I want to do. I want to build God a house. And Nathan, you remember the story. He said, sure, that sounds good. Do everything that's in your heart. I mean, who's going to say no to David? He was just on fire at that point in his life. It's like everything he wrote was Bible. And, you know, God was blessing him. And so Nathan says, sure, that sounds good. But when Nathan went home, God spoke to Nathan and said, you've told David a wrong thing. He should, he's not allowed to build me a house. His son will build me a house, but he's not allowed to build me a house. Later we learn it was because David had so much blood on his hands. He was a man of war. But this is the promise that God made to David in that passage. Because Nathan came back and said, but God says that he's, David, going to build you a house. And this is specifically what I want you to think of today in this study. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. God said, And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, can you imagine the mood that would be in Israel after learning of this promise that God had made to David as they wondered who of David's sons, of David's offspring, are going to be the fulfillment of this incredible promise that God gave. God said one of David's sons, one of his offspring, one of his descendants, 
God would establish his kingdom, he would build a house for him, and he would establish his throne forever. So with a promise like that, every person in Israel would look at all the sons of David and wonder, is this going to be the guy? Is this our hope? David can't build the house. David is not going to be the one with the throne forever. It's going to be one of his descendants. Is it Amnon? They would have first wondered. And then we already saw Amnon, David's firstborn son, he died. Is it Absalom? And that's the question that we're going to answer today. You know, this guy with the long hair and all of that, is it Absalom? And the answer is going to be no. And over and over again, they would wonder, is it this guy? Is it this guy? Is it this guy? Until finally, they realized it was none of them. And then years later, the prophets would come along and continue to predict the branch of David, the house of David is going to be revived and his kingdom will last forever. You see, the one that God was really speaking of was not Absalom, not Amnon, but who? Jesus. Good, that's the right answer. Downstairs is the right answer. It's the right answer up here. Jesus. Jesus is the right answer. And so in this passage, we're going to see the, the wrong fulfillment, the guy who isn't the one to fulfill that promise. We're going to watch him die. And in so doing, we're going to see some contrasts to our Lord uh, as well. So I, we're going to see how this testifies of Christ. Jesus said in John 5, 39, that the scriptures bear witness of me. And we're going to see that today. So we'll look at three things today. We're going to see the battle itself. We're going to look at Absalom's death. And then we're going to see David's response to Absalom's death. And I think in looking at David's response, we're going to learn a little something about the heart of God as well, the Father God and how he felt about the death of his son. So let's read first about the battle in verse 1 through 8. It says, Then David mustered the men who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. So David's army has grown you know, during the time that he's been out there in the wilderness living in Mahanaim. And David, verse 2, sent out the army, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third under the command of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Ittai the Gittite. So you might remember Ittai from a couple weeks ago. I'm sure you're just like, I, I totally recognize that guy. But I'll remind you, Ittai was the one who, he was a Philistine mercenary who'd converted to David, and when David was fleeing, Ittai came with his 600 Philistine warriors, and David said, you just got here yesterday. You can go back to Jerusalem. You shouldn't come out into the wilderness with me. But Ittai said, no, uh, Wherever you go, I'm going to go. If you die there, I'm going to die. I'm going to live with you. I'm devoted to you. So he became a, a commander over a third of David's army. And then David said to them in verse 2, it says, and, and the king said to the men, I myself will also go out with you. But the men said, you shall not go out. For if we flee, they will not care about us. If half of us die, they will not care about us, but you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better that you send us help from the city. The king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood at the side of the gate while all the army marched out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king, verse 5, ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man, Absalom. So this is very interesting. They're all leaving the city, Mahanaim. They're leaving the city. David's by the gate. And within earshot of everyone, he tells his commanders, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, he says, take it easy on my son. Take it easy on Absalom. You know, don't, don't kill him is kind of the idea. And all the people, verse 5, heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders about Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The idea is David defeated Absalom. 20,000 of Absalom's men died in the battle. But the battle, verse 8, spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. The, the idea being that David had wandered in the wilderness for years when he was a younger man. He was tactically intelligent, and so when Absalom brought his men out into 
battle. David knew where to go in the forest. He knew how to strategically position himself. So Absalom didn't stand a chance. You know, David just had all of this strategy and all that. So the forest devoured more people than the sword. Now, just a couple of things for us to learn just from the battle itself, maybe some applications for us to take home, just some points for us to consider. Number one, I think we need to recognize or remember the biblical concept that faithfulness in small things in life, in God's economy, leads to greater opportunity. Faithfulness leads to opportunity. And and part of the reason we see that is because Ittai becomes a commander of a third of David's army. You know, when you're reading who's in charge of David's army, you've got Joab, number one, then you've got Abishai, number two. It would have been very natural for the third one to be their third brother, this guy named uh, Asahel. But Asahel's already dead at this point. It was Abner that killed him. So David has to figure out who's going to be the third guy. I've got Joab, I've got Abishai, but there's one more. And he promotes this man, Ittai, into that position of leadership in his military. You see, Ittai had been faithful in the small things, faithful to David in the days of its of obscurity, and the Lord, or excuse me, David promotes him in a beautiful way. A great example of this in the New Testament would be men like Stephen and Philip in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8. They were part of the first group of seven deacons in the early church. They were financial, they were responsible for taking care of the finances in the church at that time because the apostles said it's not good for us to leave the word of God to serve tables, to take care of the, these financial matters for this daily distribution to widows. And they served well, but God opened up more opportunities for them because of their good service to the church. Stephen preached to the religious leaders and became the first martyr in the book of Acts. And Stephen preached in Samaria and then down in Gaza to a key Ethiopian figure. It was through his work that the gospel began to spread into a non-Jewish community, really in some senses for the very first time. But it all began for both Stephen and Philip with faithfulness in the small things. So I'm just trying to point out to you, here's this man, Ittai. He was faithful, and it led to opportunity in his life. Another thing I think that we can learn here from this first little battle episode is that good friends give helpful counsel. It's it's always stood out to me as interesting that Joab and Abishai and Ittai, they come to David, who says to them, I'm going to go with you into battle, and they come to him and they say, it's not good for you to go with us into battle. And part of the reason that it's interesting is because we remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, when David made a decision not to go into battle. You remember that? It was very bad. He stayed home at the time when all the kings go out to battle. He wandered around on the roof of his house, and that's when he saw Bathsheba. He got himself into grave sin because he refused to go out into battle. So we love it now that here's David saying to his men, I'm going to go with you into battle. But they say, no, you shouldn't go with us. And I think that there were two big reasons why they told him not to go with them. Number one, it seems that there was a tactical or strategic reason to to rebuff David. They had learned through their intelligence network there in Jerusalem that Absalom's plan was to attack David and David alone. That Absalom didn't care about all the armies of David, but David alone. If he could strike David, he felt that he would be victorious. And so perhaps these guys are thinking, hey, strategically, you go out into battle with us, you got your big white horse or whatever, and everybody knows there's the king. They're just going to strategically just go after you. That's all they're going to care about. You're worth more to them than 10,000 of us. So stay in the city, stay in hiding, and we'll defend you. But it seems that there was also another motivation for these guys to counsel David in this way. It seems that they understood that David did not want to confront his son Absalom. And we already know this. Because in every episode before this, David did not want to rebuke Absalom. He didn't want to deal with Absalom. But as the story progresses, what we're going to see is that David's heart is broken up over the death of Absalom. It would have killed him to actually be face-to-face with his own son and to have to make a decision to take his son's life. And I think these three men, in understanding that, 
gave David a little bit of an out. And part of the reason that I think that that's what they were doing is because it seems very unlike David because then he says, okay, that's fine, I'll stay home. Doesn't that not sound like David at all? He sounds, he's usually the kind of guy that's like, what? You're questioning me? I'm going to go to war. I'm going to fight Goliath. I'm going to fight the Philistines. I'm going to go to battle. But I think he was waiting for an excuse to stay home. It pained his heart to consider having to actually fight against his own son. So think about that for a second. Just sort of store it in your mind as we move through this passage. But good friends give helpful counsel. It says in Proverbs 27, verse 9, that the heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. And have good friends, brothers or sisters in Christ that will give you good counsel. And then perhaps another lesson that we can learn from this battle scene is that rebellion does not work out in the end. You had these 20,000 men who rebelled from David to Absalom and they lost their lives in this war against David. Now, considering the battle, let's move on and let's read of Absalom's death in verse 9 to 18. Let's read it in verse 9. It says, And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under, under him went on. Okay, so there he is. He's cruising along on his mule. Uh, I know when we think of a mule, we think of just like... You know, just slowly moving on. But it was probably a little bit larger than our modern mule. Uh, he was the king, after all, and it was probably a larger animal. It's moving rather quickly. He's in the forest. He's looking around. He's looking backwards. The narrator has already told us that he's got this huge head of hair. So the idea here is that he doesn't notice, and, and this huge tree comes along, and he just gets caught in this tree. And there he is, hanging, because the mule keeps going, keeps running, and he's hanging between heaven and earth, it says, well, the mule that was under him went on. And a certain man, verse 10, saw it and told Joab, behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man who told him, what, you saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you 10 pieces of silver and a belt. So, Apparently the guy needed a belt. His, <laughs> his pants were sagging or something. He's like, I'll throw in a belt for you too, brother. Uh, but the man said in verse 12 to Joab, he said, even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king, king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai For my sake, protect the young man, Absalom. So this guy, he's got a quick reply for Joab. I love how poetic it is. You know, he just says to him, you know, you're offering me 10. You said you would have given me 10 pieces of silver and a belt. If I fell in my hand a thousand pieces of silver, I would not have done it because I heard what David said. And then he said in verse 13, on the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there's nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. You know, what he's telling Joab is he's like, look, if word got back to the king that I was the one that killed Absalom and the king called me to give account of myself, you would have just stepped right on back. You wouldn't have said a word. You would not have defended me. I know that about you. So Joab responded in verse 14. Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then Joab blew the trumpet and the troops came back from pursuing Israel for Joab restrained them. And they took Absalom and threw him into a great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones. And all Israel fled away, uh, fled everyone to his own home. Now Absalom, verse 18, in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself the pillar that is in the king's valley, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar after his own name, and it is called Absalom's monument 
to this day. Now, none of this surprises us, knowing what we know about Absalom. The narrator tells us, look, there was a time in Absalom's life where he had no sons. Earlier, a few chapters earlier, we get a little bit of a family tree from Absalom, and we know that he did have some sons at some point, and so what's possible is that they had died or that he had built the monument for himself before he had sons. And so in worry about his future, before he had sons, he builds this monument so that people, after he's dead, uh, will remember him. And again, this is not surprising, knowing what we know about Absalom, that he would go around building monuments uh, for himself. All right, now this is the death of Absalom. That's what we just read about, the death of Absalom. So, so excited that life group is happening this week. This is the first week that you get to discuss. All right, so you're going to get to talk about the death of Absalom. Uh, the way it happens, it's just really clear. He's in the forest, he gets caught, the young warrior sees him, reports it to the general Joab. Joab asks, why didn't you kill him? He gives him the reason why. I wouldn't betray him for a thousand pieces of silver. Joab takes three javelins, thrusts it through into Absalom's heart while he's still alive. That emboldens Joab's ten chief armor bearers who are young men. They rise up, they also strike Absalom. They take his body from the tree, put it in a pit, and then heap stones upon it, like this is your tomb now. And then the narrator wants us to know. And he'd also, beyond just that tomb, he had another memorial that he'd built for himself uh, back in the king's city. Uh, for me, in reading this and thinking about the death of Absalom, it is difficult not to see the... First of all, the disappointment from the people of Israel. There were many who assumed that Absalom would fulfill that promise from God, that he would be the one whose throne was established forever. So now they know he's not the guy. He's got no offspring. He's not the guy. He's not going to be the one whose throne is established forever. But in seeing the way that Absalom died, at least for me, it's difficult not to see a contrast between the way that the true Messiah, the one who did fulfill the promises, that God made to David, how he died, how Jesus died. Let me show you a few different things that are in contrast. Number one, Absalom died with many others, but Jesus died alone. Absalom died with many others, but Jesus died alone. Now, I realize that when Jesus died on the cross, there were thieves who were also dying with him on his right and on his left. But what I mean is, he was the only one to die of his company, of his group. In fact, Jesus prayed about this in John chapter 17 before he went to the cross when he announced to the Father, Father, I have kept, I have preserved every single one that you have given to me. I've guarded all of them. I watched all of them except, of course, he said, the son of destruction that the scripture may be fulfilled, a reference to Judas. That's a prayer of Christ in John 17, verse 12. So he died with many others, uh, Absalom did, but Jesus died alone. There were 20,000 people that died with Absalom, but Christ died alone. Number two, Absalom was caught up in a tree by his pride or his hubris, but Jesus went to his tree or was caught up in his tree with humility. You see, there's something about the way the New Testament authors speak of the cross of Jesus where we are to understand that Jesus did, though he died on a cross, when you think about it in Old Testament terms, it was as if he died upon a tree. And the reason for that uh, was because in the Old Testament, God had said in Deuteronomy chapter 21, that when a man was hanged on a tree, he was cursed. And so the New Testament authors took that concept and said that Jesus was hung on a tree, that he was cursed while he hung upon the cross. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Or Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So when you see Absalom hanging on a tree, uh, it's... I think meant to in your mind, knowing the full scope of Scripture, to think of Jesus hanging on his tree. But how did Absalom get there? 
Well, it doesn't say particularly that he was hanging by his hair, but isn't that how you imagine it in your mind? The narrator's already told us. He has this long hair. It's so thick that every time he cuts it, they have a big weighing ceremony and all of that. So don't you just imagine him riding his mule, the hair's flowing and all of that. He looks back and he gets caught in this tree and this hair is caught, all caught. I had a guy after the nine o'clock service, he said, when you were telling that story, I was thinking about a time when I was a kid and my sister and I were riding our bicycles and her hair was flowing and we rode next to this blackberry bush and boom, her hair got caught. And her bike just kept going, and I had to come back, and I had to pull all her hair, you know, out of that, out of that uh, blackberry bush. You know, that, that's, I think, supposed to be the idea. This thing that he's so proud of ends up being his demise. But Jesus, of course, did not go to the cross because of any vain glory or pride within himself, but because of humility within his heart. It says in Philippians 2, verse 8, that Jesus, being found in human form, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So how did Absalom get stuck in his tree? Well, probably with a little bit of pride, or because of pride. But Jesus, because of his humility, he went to the cross. By the way, when Paul says that in Philippians chapter 2, he's not just saying, hey, I just want to kind of talk about how the cross worked for a moment. He actually first gives an exhortation to the church. He says, I want you to treat one another with humility. Have the same mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And then he expands upon the mind and the heart of Jesus. And so his desire is that we would treat each other with humility because Jesus, in humility, became obedient to the point of death. Number three, Absalom was not sold out by a stranger, but Jesus was sold out by a friend. I, did you notice that there? There's this soldier. Abs, uh, Joab says to him, I'd have given you 10 pieces of silver if you had killed Absalom. And the soldier says, for even a thousand pieces of silver, I wouldn't have touched this guy because I know what King David would have done to me. This guy is a stranger to Absalom and is an enemy to Absalom but he would not touch Absalom for a thousand pieces of silver. But when Jesus came along, he was betrayed, of course, by one of his innermost disciples, a man whom he referred to in the Garden of Gethsemane as his friend, Judas Iscariot, for a measly sum of 30 pieces of silver. You guys know the reason the religious leaders had to do that was because they needed a friend to tell them where Jesus was staying at nighttime. They, they wanted to arrest Jesus, but Jesus was so popular that they couldn't arrest him in broad daylight. You know, if Jesus is like there teaching or something in the temple and people are there gathering together, they got their like, we love Jesus signs and t-shirts and they want to get his autograph. They realized like we can't go and arrest him in the middle of all these people. He's so popular. But at nighttime, at that time, Jesus was in hiding with his disciples. So they didn't know where he was at night to arrest him in secret, so they had to hire a friend. And, and Judas understood where Jesus would have been, the Garden of Gethsemane, the night uh, before the cross. And so he sold Jesus out for a small sum, a friend, a trusted companion, as uh, Psalm 55, verse 13 speaks of, betrayed Christ. Number four, Absalom was speared multiple times while alive, but Jesus was speared once after his death. Absalom's there, he's hanging in the tree. He's still living though, you know, he's like wiggling around and I don't know if people were like talking to him or if he's saying like, get me out of here, you know, or whatever, but he's alive. Joab comes up with three spears, kills him. Jesus also was speared while he hung on his tree but he was speared after he had already died. And this was actually biblically important because the Old Testament prophecies had declared that when the Messiah came and died, not one of his bones would be broken. But Jesus was crucified on a holy day. And the religious leaders had a deal with the Romans that when the Romans were crucifying someone on a holy day, in order to speed up the death of the people on the cross, they would come by after you know five or six hours and they would break the legs of the people that were on the cross. 
And the reason they would break the legs is so that the person could no longer use their leg strength to push themselves up to be able to get breath while they were on the cross. You could die on the cross for almost a week at times. And so rather than have a religious festival with people living and you know, going through the death process on the cross, they would come by and break their legs. Well, when they came to Jesus, they discovered that he was already dead. And so what they did was they took a spear to prove that he was dead and pierced his side and outflowed blood and water, which we understand medically today means that his heart had already ruptured at that point. He was already dead. And all of that was done to fulfill the Old Testament predictions that not one of his bones would be broken. Just one of those prophecies that Jesus, you know, couldn't fulfill of his own volition. It was the sovereignty of God that brought it to pass. Also with Absalom, number five, he died because of his own rebellious sin, but Jesus died for our rebellious sin. There's, there's a picture here that you probably, at least at first reading, you know, from our vantage point, we would have missed, but the people of Israel would not have missed. And it's real simple. Absalom was as rebellious of a son as you could possibly get. I mean, he was so rebellious. He rebelled against his father. And the Israelites had a law that said, if you were a re rebellious child, like an uber rebellious child, and your parents went to the elders of Israel, like it got that bad, where your parents are just like, this guy or gal is a cancer to our whole society. We are so done. The elders, if they approved, could approve capital punishment for the rebellious child with the, by, and it was death by stoning. Now, we don't have any biblical record of this ever happening, of a parent actually getting to that point where they're like, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm going to the elders. I'm sure there were a few threats from time to time, you know, and I had one more word, and I'm going to the elders. Never happened, though. But this whole thing, if you were an Israelite reading this, you would think, of those laws, those mandates. You'd see this rebellion, rebellious son thrown into a pit and stones being heaped upon him. It would remind you that this man was guilty of his own rebellion, but you see, when Jesus died for us, he didn't die for his own rebellious sin, but he died for our rebellious sin. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And then finally, number six, Absalom made a monument because he had no sons, but Jesus' monument gives birth to many sons and daughters. You know, Absalom built this thing that replaced the fact that he had no sons. Like, look at this. I know I had no sons. Look at this and remember me. But when we look to the cross of Christ and remember Jesus, it's the very thing that actually produced a lot of sons. It's actually pretty interesting because in the book of Acts, I talked about Philip earlier. There's this episode where Philip goes down into Gaza and there's this Ethiopian eunuch who's going back to Ethiopia after worshiping in Jerusalem. And he's reading Isaiah 53 and he reads this portion of Isaiah 53 which speaks of the Messiah having no generation to speak of. Something... Uh, single Ethiopian eunuch man might be wondering about, like, how, who's going to proclaim this man's generation? How's that going to be fulfilled? He's got no offspring. Well, it's the cross of Jesus that produces that great offspring. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, that it was through the cross that many sons were brought to glory. Yeah, his great monument gives birth to many sons. All right, so that's the death of Absalom contrasted with the death of Christ. But let's look at Finally, in verse 19, the way that David responded to this news. It happens through these messengers that come running to him. So let's read it in verse 19. It says, Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run and carry news to the king that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of his enemies. Now, just a reminder, Zadok was the priest living in Jerusalem. Ahimaaz had been a spy who had heard news from his father, Zadok, and brought it to David before. So now he tells Joab, hey, let me do my job. I want to go run to David and tell him what happened. Joab said to him, verse 20, you are not to carry news today. 
you may carry news another day, but today you shall carry no news because the king's son is dead. So Joab is thinking about Ahimaaz, and he's, Joab is thinking about all the other times where somebody brought a message to David about uh, one of the royals in Israel and their death. Saul, Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, every single person that brought David news, he's dead, uh, David killed them because they took credit for it. And so Joab's a little nervous about it. He's like, Ahimaaz, I like you. I don't want to send you to David with that kind of news. But there was another guy that Joab apparently didn't like as much, so <laughs> he's going to send him in verse 21. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you've seen. The Cushite bowed before Joab and ran. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, Come what may, let me also run after the Cushite. Ahimaaz really wants to give David news. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, seeing that you will have no reward for your news? I can't pay you for this job. I already sent the Cushite. Come what may, verse 23, he said, I will run. He was very persistent. So he said to him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. So the idea is that the Cushite took a direct route to David, probably had to go over some mountains to get to David. But Ahimaaz took a longer route, but it was flat. It was the way of the plain, so he got there more quickly. Now David, verse 24, was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out and told the king, and the king said, if he's alone, there is news in his mouth. You know, David understood. Like, if there's just one guy, it doesn't mean that they're in retreat. It means that he's a runner. He's bringing news. And he drew nearer and nearer, the runner did. The watchman, verse 26, saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gate and said, see, another man running alone. The king said, he also brings news. The watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. So apparently Ahimaaz had some kind of like look about him with his run, you know, some kind of funky gait or something. And so they're like, I think that's Ahimaaz. And the king said, he's a good man and comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz, verse 28, cried out to the king, all is well. And he bowed before the king with his face to the earth and said, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the King. And the King said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, your servant, I saw a great commotion, but I do not know what it was. And the king said, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. So Ahimaaz claims that he doesn't know what happened to uh, Absalom. Now, maybe he's telling the truth that he didn't see Absalom's death and he just saw this big commotion. But remember what Joab said to him? Joab said, you can't go because the king's son is dead. So Ahimaaz knew full well that Absalom was dead, but he just couldn't bring himself to give the full news to David. And behold, verse 31, the Cushite came and the Cushite said, good news for my lord the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. So that was his way of saying he's dead. And the king was deeply moved, verse 33, and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So here David begins to weep, you know, Absalom's death. And actually, we're going to see next week, Joab is going to have to rebuke David for this mood that David has about his death. Because the warriors of Israel or David's warriors, they all come back, and there's David crying and weeping and all sad, acting like they lost when actually they had won. And so Joab has to rebuke him, like, hey, man, you're bumming out all your warriors. They laid down their lives for you, and you're mourning over your son who was wicked and deserved to die, you know, so this isn't good. 
But that was the attitude, the mood, the spirit of David. Now, if I may, I would like to draw your attention to just some contrasts between David as a father and his attitude about Absalom's death and our father in heaven and his attitude concerning the death of his son. Number one, David regained the throne while losing his son, but the father regained the throne while regaining his son. You see, Absalom was dead and gone. And David, through his death, regained the throne. But the father in heaven regained his throne through the death of his son, but also regained his son. This is part of what Jesus prayed about before he went to the cross. It says in John 17, verse 5, he said to to his father, he said, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. So there was the idea there that, yes, the son is going to go and die. The father would mourn the death of his son, but he would also receive his son back to himself. He would get the throne through the death of his son, but also receive his son back to himself. And Jesus, of course, would ascend and be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1, verse 3. Number two, David avoided Absalom's death, but the father partnered with the Son in the atonement. This is very obvious when you just open up the New Testament and you begin to read the Gospel account. It was not just the desire of the Son, Jesus, to come and live and then suffer and die for all of humanity. It was the desire of Father God. It was a partnership with the Father in heaven. David wanted to avoid Absalom's death, but the Father in heaven, he partnered with the Son that he might die to atone for the sins of the world. It says in Romans 3, verse 25, that God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood. Number three, David requested that they deal gently with Absalom. But listen to this. The Father laid our iniquity upon his son. When it says there in Romans Three, verse 25, like I quoted, that God put forward Jesus, it says that he put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. That, that means that Jesus became the satisfaction of the divine wrath of God, that he satisfied God's wrath, God's anger. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. So there's this idea here. David is so light concerning Absalom. Like, I don't want to touch my son Absalom, deal gently with my son Absalom. But Father God thinks of his son and says, no, I'm going to lay upon him the iniquity of humanity. I'm going to satisfy my wrath in in his own body. Now in saying something like that, I realize that that is a provocative thought. That there is this wrath of God that is satisfied, propitiated for in the cross of Jesus. And in thinking about that, there's a few things that we have to remember. Number one, we have to remember the nature of God's wrath. It is not like your wrath or my wrath or the wrath of any false god that has ever been created or put forth. You know, my wrath is momentary. It is a burst. It is anger that is reactive. But God's wrath, God's displeasure is is something that slowly with patience and grace builds over a long period of time. It is his seated displeasure against what he sees happening in humanity that is killing humanity. It is his displeasure with the sin that we commit that is hurting ourselves. Another thing that we have to remember is that when God did this, when the Father laid upon the Son the iniquity of us all and made Jesus the propitiation for our sins, when that happens, we have to remember That there is the biblical doctrine of the triunity or the trinity of God. You see, if 
Christians believed that there were three separate and distinct gods that we worshipped, and that God was not one, then it may seem to us bizarre that God, number one, Father, placed His wrath upon God to the Son. But the reality is, though there are three distinct persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, they are one together. Our God is one. So, as difficult as that is for us to comprehend and to understand, with that doctrine, it helps us to understand the pain that the Father Himself would have endured in sending His Son to die upon the cross. I don't think there's any violation of our Christology to say that the Father suffered as God the Son was there upon the cross. You know, there would have been pain within the Father's heart. And then we also have to remember the, who originated that propitiation or that satisfaction. In every other religion, for a God to be satisfied or propitiated, it's the worshiper that goes to the God and says, please, let your wrath be abated. But in Christianity, it is Father God who says, I want my wrath to be satisfied. I, I want this displeasure, this settled anger against the sin of humanity. I want it to be done away with. What can I do to satisfy my anger, my, my wrath against unholiness? What can I do to deal with it? And he sent his son. So all that to say, you know, there's David wanting to deal gently with Absalom, but the father laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Two more things. Number four, David hoped for the good news that Absalom was alive, but the father created the good news, the gospel, through Jesus' death. We, of course, understand that one. Da David was hoping, you know, he sees these messengers, he's like, there's a good man, he's coming with good news. But it wasn't good news, it was bad news to him. But the Father created the good news through the death of Jesus. And then finally, number five, David despaired for his son, but the Father, though he did despair for his son, despaired also for humanity. He wanted so badly for humanity to be saved that he sent his only begotten son. So again, the death of Absalom, he's not going to be the one to fulfill those messianic promises, but Jesus would come and die a more glorious death. And I think by thinking about Absalom's death, we can think about the death of Christ and what it means for us today. So let's pray together and ask the Lord to embed this deep within our hearts. Lord, we, we thank you, we rejoice in you. We celebrate what you have done, Lord, for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's incredible for us to think about. It's incredible for us to glory in. It's incredible for us to partake of. But Lord, we thank you for it. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to grow us in that conviction of what you have done, Lord, for us. We thank you, Lord. And even in your heart this morning, perhaps just thank him. Say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for dying for me. So Lord, we love you. We rejoice in you. And we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon us this week as we go our way. Set your hand upon us, your spirit upon us. Enable and empower us for everything that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. God bless you guys. Let's all stand together and sing this closing chorus to the Lord. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came.
you today. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday.